This whole thing on this automatic started one day when I was talking to Tracy and he mentioned that he wanted to learn how to uh, make an auto and I said well I've done some of those and next thing I know I see I'm a demonstrator for today. <laughs> That's how it happened. So I hadn't made one for years and then back then it was uh, I was making liner locks so this is made to be pinned together instead of screwed together. So I had to get busy and learn how to do it so I could show you guys. So it works. And this is a lock back. So uh, we're going to tear it apart and I'll show you how I did it and uh, ask questions anytime. I started Basically, I'd made a lot of uh, lock back, so that wasn't an issue to make that part. So, but once I got that done, then I had to figure out how to hold this thing closed and, and uh, open, of course, locking it open was not a problem. But uh, So I um, knew that Chris Crawford in Mississippi had been, had been doing this, making these, and uh, I'd met him last year, and so I got a hold of him, and he... I got a video, he's got a really good video on how to do this. So what I did first after I got the lock part done is I had this blade that would open and close but it wouldn't, you know, I had to have a mechanism to uh, keep it closed and release it to open it. So uh, that led to uh, I'll get, take this apart here first. <clears throat> Again. Figuring out where I wanted the hole, I used a hole in this case. There are other ways to do it. This is, the, this is just the way I did it. There are many ways to make these things. And Anyway, uh, I figured out where I wanted the hole and I wanted it to be in a position where it wouldn't show much at all. Of course closed doesn't but when it's open I didn't want it to show. Now Chris's does which just my preference you know nothing wrong with that it's just that I didn't want it to show so I made the bolster quite a bit longer. So once I got that hole where figured out where I wanted it um, had to be kind of on the center line of the knife when it was closed um, in the bolster, or in the uh, ricasso, the tang, marked, I had drilled uh, the hole here through the liner first. And of course that allowed me to make the hole in the blade, position it through this hole. Marked it and drilled it. And, uh, but what I discovered, I'm gonna tell you, you know, what, what to watch out for here as, as we go. Um, when the, it's in the closed position and there's spring tension against it, even though I was really careful, the tip of the blade was a little too high in the corner because of spring pressure and play in everything in the latch. So I had to grind off a little off the tip to get it down below the corner. So uh, once I got the holes both made, then it was time to make this latch. So that is, uh, I drew it here, but I'll draw it with a bigger pin. Started with a, just a little block of um, CPM 154. Now in Chris's video, I did it a little different than what he did because he band sawed and, mill, and uh, ground and filed this material this is waste here. You want to be left with this. And then he files this part, this little tang, round. But I looked at that and I decided it's way easier just to put it in the milling machine, put it in the vise and mill that off, which worked out. Then all I had to do, I didn't have to worry about cleaning that up. I just filed the, this, the latch round and keep ta checking until it fits through the hole. Um, 
Once that was done, we put it to uh, put it back on here, put the latch in without a spring. And then what happens is because this opens on an arc, if things are a close fit, it won't open because the tip of the the tip of this swings out. So in Chris's video, he cut he files the the tip of this until it um, will Open. will clear. Yeah, clear. Yeah, and so what I instead of doing that, I wanted to keep as much material on here because years ago when I made these with making you know when I was making liner locks, uh, I wasn't so successful with the latch because they would people would play with them like a fidget spinner until they wore the latch out and then they'd want them fixed. So I wanted to make sure that I had enough material to so that prevent that from happening as long as possible. So I filed away out of the hole instead. And uh, and finally, you know, just trial and error got it to release. Then this tubing here, this is a little piece of tubing that's uh, soldered on. And I'll, this will be passed around here. But uh, this is 1 16th tubing with a 1 32nd hole from Hobby Lobby. And right alongside that, they've got this piano wire that's uh, 31 thousandths, I believe, that fits right in there. That's your hinge pivot. That's your, that's your hinge pivot right there. Okay. So that was next. I, I soldered this piece of tubing on there. The one thing I would do differently next time is I put it in the middle the fulcrum is in the middle and I don't have quite enough leverage. I should have moved it forward a little bit to get more leverage when I open it. That the longer I, your the, fulcrum, the more that end's going to move up with it, less pressure. Right, but the trade-off, of course, is, you, is this doesn't move as much right. to lift it either. So, so you got to figure out that balance point, you know. But I overcame that and we'll talk about that in a little bit too. This little spring right here yeah, when you change windshield wipers on your cars, you dissect that and there's a little piece of stainless steel in there. <laughs> and you don't have to do anything to it except drill a hole through it. It's, uh, I think it's about 30 thousandths thick too. So, they're uh, <laughs> readily available. <laughs> <laughs> Any Walmart, you can find all you <laughs> yeah, want. You, you can get them, you can get them, you can, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can find them new or used. Okay, so this wire here, I actually got a hold of it. These, you know, this isn't the first one I made for this, obviously. So you soldered that whole tube on oh, and yeah. cut out the knot. Oh, yeah. Yes, and that's another thing when when Chris does this, he uses a Dremel and he gets in there. And I figure, why do I want to do that when I've got a milling machine? I just milled an eighth inch slot in there. This is an eighth inch thick. It dropped it in. Works out. Questions so far? I'm gonna I'm gonna be done before the hour is up here, so you gotta ask questions. Okay. So for your springs, now you're using treated that. steel. Now you can also use like piano wire, and that's pretty common. Yes, you can. Uh, Forty thou, sixty thou. You know, if you're getting into a high torque auto, you're looking at eighty or ninety thou thick piano wire. It's on am it's everywhere. And, yeah, you know, it's and, easy. And it's to already pre-hardened. You don't got to do anything. You just slice it and bend it to what you want. So you can use that for this spring, for your back spring. There's also setups where he's got a you know he's got a wishbone setup, but you could also use again a piano wire in there, and you'll see a lot of guys use that. Instead yeah. Of this wishbone. This wishbone is a lot harder than it looks. The only the the the. The good thing is it's just one piece, but the bad thing is that you have to draw it to a spring temper and your blade is blade temper, harder, so this is going to wear before this does. If you put a piano wire in there or a, sec a separate spring, then you can leave this hard, as hard as your blade. So, in fact, that's one thing I didn't mention. This latch, I had issues with it before wearing, so it is 
the same temper as the blade. So, and then the other thing is when you do that, you want to radius the corner where it, where it catches a little bit because if it's sharp, it will wear something. So radius both of them a little bit. Just, it doesn't have to be hardly any, but it's got to be radius. So let's see. So for see. your tempering on that spring, you're shooting for 48 range? 46, 48, yep. Yep. And then once you get it tempered at like, let's just say 47, if it's too thick, you don't change your temper, you just grind the spring back a little bit to make it work. You can also do that with piano wire. Yes, that's true. And this spring was a lot wider when I started, when I put it in the knife, and it was easy enough to close, but when I pushed the button, I, oh, no, it wouldn't open. I couldn't push it hard enough. That's part of the reason why I wish the fulcrum was further forward. But, but uh, especially having, using a little depression here, for it to push it into, I, I, it was really difficult. Well, I realized that when I did get it to pop open, it went open hard. I had plenty of action here so I could thin this down. And I kept doing that. I'd, I'd thin it a little bit and I'd, and I'd uh, try it and trial and error. Uh, and, and when I thin it, what I do is I take a felt tip pen and I uh, I did it on the back side. What I do is I tip it like that and I go like that and you get this nice thin line right on the edge. So you've got something to grind to. You can grind away part of that line or all of it or whatever you need to do. And uh, kept doing that until I got it tamed down enough so that I can open it easily as you saw. So, and, and there is room to go farther with that, but I had it working and I wanted it to stay working for today, so I quit. <laughs> I quit. I made a little hole right here in the, the tang, if you will, on the spring to drop a piece of 1 16th stock in just to hold it there. But when I did that, I wasn't thinking about the fact that I weakened that right there. I should have drilled it on the other side. So, it, but, and I did bend that, actually. I had to bend it back a couple times, but but now that the spring is thinned down enough, it isn't an issue anymore. It, it's a little bit loose, but I'll tighten that up. And it, right now it's been staying there. So uh, let's see, what else? Let's put it together, I guess. Questions? So you're set up with a bushing. Bushing, yep, put and, bushings uh, and everything. So, so how do you get the inside right where you want it? And then how thick, how much oversize is this bushing compared to the blade? The, I, um, this is, what do they call it? It's, it's bearing bronze that I bought from McMaster Car and I think it comes in two foot lengths. Oil length? Nope. No, no oil length comes in little pieces, okay. believe it or not. So, so no, this is two feet long and I, I uh, have a nice accurate lathe, I chuck it in with a, in a collet chuck and uh, use a center drill and then a drill and drill it out to number 41. Uh, a little bit of play there doesn't matter and, and when, when you're making slip joints, it's a lot more critical about this fitting of the, of the everything as far as your tang goes but these not so much you know because there's it's just easier less critical uh the the bushing is in the, right now it's one thousandth longer than the blade is thick and uh how to get that is is tracy's got these i'm sure you've got these in stock don't you Pivot lap? Pivot, yeah. pivot lap. Yeah, it's just a little block of steel with a hole in it that's the same size as the bushing is and with a little plunger. And, uh, and you uh, put your bushing in there and you just move it around on a piece of sandpaper. And I usually, the, the, the sandpaper is, the coarsest I go is 800. Sometimes I go as fine as 2,000 grit to get right down to the last little bit. At one thousandths, when I pass this around, if you hold that together tight there, 
there's still wobble in that blade. That's thick. That's, that's a lot of 1,000. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it is in this case. So there's that. So to use these, you're going to put your part in. Yep, drop Whatever your bushing it is, in there. a pivot, uh, a standoff, a stop pin, a bushing with the right it. diameter. And then uh, these little plungers. Is that 316s? Yeah, it is. And you're just going to go like that. And then on a surface plate, a flat yep. surface, could be a piece of glass, could be a surface plate. It you could start be. with 400 grit, at maybe. Now, if you got a mile, I mean, if you got 30, 40 thou to take off, I, I use 120 and scrub it a couple times. Right. Then I'll switch over to a 400 or a 600, and I'll walk it right in, and I guarantee you can, you can control to a tenth the thickness on that. And, and some then, sometimes on worn sandpaper, I'll move it two inches. And that's and it. make a you difference might, you, you on might just fine do that. paper. Yep. Normally, I'll scrub. If I got a lot to take off, I'll scrub it this way. And then then I'll, when I start measuring with the with caliper, I'll just... Just like that, check it. Just like that, check it. Micrometer, yeah, Micrometer, caliper. Micrometer, yeah, yeah. Said caliper, sorry. Yep. So these bushings change out. There's different diameters that will hold, uh, you know, different uh, size stock. And then uh, I, since I've been fooling around with folders lately, I had a couple extra bushing sizes made. So we've got them in, I think, like five different uh, sizes now. But I use these on every single knife I make. Hands as, down. as do I, yeah. By the way, these two these two are Tracy's and they are available. And it's this his last, last two, two, he tells yeah. me. <laughs> we we'll got more coming. Yeah. So. What do you have on the floors when you drop that little part? It doesn't shoot all the way across the shop and lose. Uh, it. I just make another one. <laughs> That's that that is not the first piece of wire that went into that <laughs> bushings. I have a little cup full that I've found later. You know, in fact, this bushing is one that I found and put in here because it it was made for a different knife, but it happened to be a little too long and it it actually fit the hole. I didn't have to do anything to it. So and and the hole. Uh, when I make these, the hole in the blade for the bushing, it's, uh, well, it doesn't have to come out of there. The drill it undersize, ream it to, to 3 16 and then after heat treatment, you use a barrel lap to lap it smooth. Then the bushing goes in. And that bushing stock happens to be really good stuff. I don't have to do anything to the outside of that. You don't so, have to melt the outside the 316. I don't, I don't turn it at all. No, I just part it off and and it works. So that won't go through there. So when you were soldering that key, did you put the any particular solder, silver bright? Silver, silver yeah, silver stay right? stay silver. Stay yeah. Okay. Stay silver that you can buy at your welding store works. Yep, and he covers that really well in that video. Okay, I'm going to pass it around. This pin is prone to dropping out, so if it does, we'll Find another put one. it back in. Yeah. Okay, so you lock bar. Your lug is going to go in like that. This angle right here, that angle, and the gap okay. right there, please. Yes, sir. I start making blade and lock bar with a rectangle. That way I can uh, index off this in the, in the vise. So I put it in, I cut this at 90 degrees. Um, depth, it's all figured out with the patterns. You know, I, I, I don't know exactly what it is, just whatever looks good. Yeah. You know how it is with us knife makers. <laughs> uh, mill it uh, to the line, sort of. And then this is, this is 90 degrees here, right angle. 
this is 8 degrees off 90. And the way I do that is I have a, uh, in fact, I've got one in the, in the car and I didn't bring in. I made, this is 332 or 100 thousands roughly. I made this wedge that's 8 degrees out of 1 16th. I don't tip the head on my mill. I just put this under here. It tips at eight degrees, and then I can mill this as vertical. Make sense? Or you can hand okay. pile it if you don't have a mill. You, the, yeah, that's, we should talk about that book. Um, uh, what's the name of that book? That, uh, uh, what's the name, Steigerwald? Uh, I'll check in the office, see if we it's have a, a Yeah, there's a book on, on making lockbacks, and that's the one thing that I got out of that book that I needed. So that's, a, that's a C's fit in there, you know, in, in, yeah. in this, and there's a, this is deceptively complicated to get that lockback to work properly. Yeah. Um, it, it, you get less than eight degrees, you're into a seizing fit. Five to seven degrees is what your, your taper is on your drill press. And you just jam, you know, your chuck up into the drill press, and that holds it. You think it wouldn't work, but it does. You know, anywhere between four to seven degrees, that's a seize fit, and you're going to have a problem with this engaging there and then not coming out. So you got to get right. just a bit past that, and then you know you got it. And then some guys will put a lint trap in there because you know it's in your yeah. pocket. And so yep. there's a little clearance. There's maybe twenty thousands between here and here when it's locked. And we'll we'll take this back apart and you can see it. Did you get it in? Yeah, you got it. Okay. Your knife maker. No. Uh, so, <laughs> so the lock bar then, the same thing. I cut it, cut that, you know, out of a rectangle before I, you know, the pattern, the thing is, the blade's drawn on there, or the lock bar, but then I cut that, so you get the eight degrees there and ninety degrees there. And if you use the same tool, it's exactly the same angle, it, it works. Then when I make blades and springs, I glue th maybe three pieces together. So I'm making three blades and springs, that, you know, doing that fit up uh, for three at once. But I also do that first because you want to make sure that whole thing works properly or you, why bother making the rest of the knife? So you do all this before you do your grinding? While these are still rectangles, they have to fit together, and I'll, I'll sh yeah, and when you, when, I can show you this after a bit too. Now this is an, this is an old timer here, but when, when, uh, when I test them, if this one is the one that's still in the vise and this one is finished, I should be able to put this in here and let go and it'll stay there. Yeah, and the same way with the blade, if you, and that works with this. You you hold onto this one and you you hold it like that and let go of the blade. It'll it'll stay right there. So then you know you've got a good fit. And as far as that, what he was talking about of binding up, that isn't the only place, is it, Cody? That that angle is critical. Okay, while that's going around, we'll talk about this thing a little bit here. Uh, this is for doing the relieving on the liner, like that. So the blade doesn't rub. And before I was, I was just, I was doing this while this was, before this was milled and just clamping it down and mill that out. But what happens is, is when you do all this milling, there's lots of, of tension in this stuff and, and it warps. And when it does, uh, you don't, you can't see it, but you get your scale glued in there. Then, then you've already milled this and you go to make it flat. And sometimes if, if you're not careful, it'll be bad enough that this will be bent enough that when you flatten that on your granite block, you'll take away, you'll grind that relief right off there. So in order to, to 
prevent that from happening, what I do now is put the scale, you know, mill this out. Don't mill this side. Mill out for the, for the uh, scale. Get the scale glued in. That's all done. Then flatten it. Then it goes in here. This uh, is a little uh, 256 screw goes through the pivot. Let's see, this one will be this way. I've got to unscrew this a little bit. This clamp is padded with a little bit of leather through there. Just a little nut on there if I can. This gets tightened up here. This goes on a rotary table. And when I mill this out, mill the relief out, it's it stays flat. I'm milling out five to five to eight thousandths is all I'm taking out of there. So that's in usually in mostly in thicker material, so it doesn't there's no warpage. So so flat is flat. And you made that jig? I made this yeah, not my idea. Somebody else had already done this. This is, well, we'll pass this all around, but this is actually, uh, there's going to be another one because I wish it was beefier. Yeah. <clears throat> and there's precision done so that it's square and parallel one. Yes, you got to keep it square. Alternatively, yeah. tooling plate, figure, you know, full size table, this is for, a, this is a miniature, but you put that on, get it centered, and then that'll rotate around. You can. And so you're going to put your, your part in there, rotate the table. So this plate obviously is too big for this rotary, but kind of the same thing. And then yep. uh, on Knife Maker's white board, if you follow that on Facebook, there was a raging debate about freehand on holding a big jig about like that. I've done that a couple times. It's a little dangerous. That's how I started, too. It, it does work. That's how Ron Lake uh, did most of his uh, inlays for years. I think he, he still does. I went to a blade form uh, this summer and Ron uh, gave a class. I went to that. I asked him specifically and that's how he's still milling some of his out on his inlays. And that's a big old heavy fixture. Mill's coming down, bring it down to depth and then he hand moves it. And I've also done <laughs> on a jig like that that's going around. You can rub it on the flat side of the shank against your outline and, and get your outline that way also. That's a little dodgier, but again, it works. You know, you do what you got to do. Everyone doesn't have a mill for, you know, so you do what you got to do to get the damn thing made. A lot of ways to skin the cat. Yeah, That's, absolutely. this is certainly not the only way to make an automatic either. There's, you can use, instead of leaf springs, you can use coil springs and, uh, and there's the uh, scale release video there too. And then here's another, this is an old knife that I, I bought it, traded, did some trading for it because I really like those scales, those bone scales. But this is a Union Cutlery made many years ago in New York. And this is a tang, it, it locks open the same way, but then when it closes, there's another, la another tab here that locks in this notch. So um, then, then there's this is the release. It goes over this bolster. There's a relief there for it. Sits on this, and then it sits on top. And when you push it forward, it lifts the lock bar. It cams it up. So lets it out of the notch. But this uh, this particular one at least wasn't very well made and it uh, 
it won't stay open or closed. So I had intended to use it. I mean, I, maybe I'll use it for a pattern. Maybe or not. Maybe not because I wasn't really happy with how it stayed closed. I don't think that's a really long has a really long lifespan. I think it wears quickly. Okay, and here's we've all seen these these things. This this one came to me because it wouldn't work. It was locked open <coughs> just before you know when I started fooling around with, with the one that's going around I uh I took it apart and discovered that this probably a pot metal lever here and it's broken right in the middle. So it everything else works if it had a new but this one has a hole there and a notch in the end of the tang to catch it. Questions? This one? I don't know. <laughs> it's just a cheap tourist junk piece anyway, so probably not. <laughs> Those are a real thing, man. Those are collectible as get out. Uh, These are? Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're I should put it back clubs. together? More so in <laughs> Europe. Um, you know, any of the Italian ones. There's there's some expensive Italian. There's two, three, four, five hundred dollar ones, versions of those. And they're all just as loose and wobbly because that's, that's what they are. But you know, if you want to specialize, that wouldn't be a bad way to go. Recently picked up a pantograph. Uh, I didn't realize I didn't realize how many knife makers have them, but this is my first first thing I cut a, cut with that. Uh, Chris Crawford, same guy, uh, makes these. He'll custom make them, or or he has on his website he has these available, different ones. Not this one. This one's mine. You won't see it available. Uh, he's 3D. He's yeah, CAD program and three. This was 3D printed, and uh, so I was amazed when I cut this pocket and I cut out the shield, and it just drops in, perfect fit. There's no handwork. No handwork whatsoever. Just it fits. The radius has to be the size of the bit. No radius can be. The radius is yeah, and I'm radius. using a one thirty second end mill. Okay. And a, and the, it's this is four to one ratio, so the end the the stylus that I use is one hundred twenty thousandths. Pass that around too. And oh, spinning! I didn't mention this to the other group, but for spinning pins, uh, there are spun heads on on wherever right here. These are spun heads, and what I've done here is this is, you all recognize these. That's just a set screw, but it's already got the depression, and it's hard steel. So all you have to do is chuck it up and turn it down. Pass it around. And then I cut a little, you can see I took my Dremel and I cut a little notch across there so it makes it work way better for me anyway. Yeah, it actually cuts the edge of the. Does that yeah. does that dome? It does. It, so it's doming and cutting both. It's it's yeah, it's swelling. It's riveting that head. Yep. Bigger. Yep. In fact, there you can see it. Yep. I'm still. And then, Rio Grande Jewelry Supply has these little polishing pins. And they've got a little different. They've got different grits and different hardnesses of Kratex, different diameters, different everything. And and this, you put these in the Dremel or the drill press, and this is how I polish those domes. Oh, and this is how I polish. Uh, right there. Mm -hmm. The 
there's kind of a whole art just to that doming. And it's, uh, and there's a learning curve. Yeah. Yep. I haven't got through that part yet. Yeah. <laughs> He's out in the rhubarb on that curve. <laughs> Questions? I'm, ru I'm running out of material. <laughs> <laughs> But it works. What's that? What's the easiest auto to start with? Easiest auto to start with? Boy. I mean, is there, is there one that's easier than another? I don't, I don't know how to answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> this was easy for me because I was already making lockbacks. Yeah. So. Yeah. I started with liner locks because you easy enough to screw together and take apart. And if you if your spring is a little longer than this particular one, you can actually in fact that's what what he does there is no he doesn't either. The the spring is longer in his and he has to go past that so his little ramp which I the ramp is on the blade on this one. But the ramp is on the spring on his. But but if you do it so that the spring is what catches, what this cat this latch catches, then it's a double action. You can open it manually. So I made I made quite a few of those too, the double action. I have no more for you. You gotta ask. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to do it.